Hello. Good First evening. Time. Hi. Hi, Sarah. Uh, okay. I guess uh, again, I'm going to say this again for people who just join us. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am really excited to be here um, and to be able to engage in conversation. Um, Sebastian uh, Sichoki, who is the chief curator of the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. Um, and to have everyone join us in a conversation, hopefully maybe at the end, um, we'll have a couple of questions that we can, you know, address so that we can continue this particular provocation on the very idea of rewilding. Um, so the talk today, sorry, yes, the, the talk today, is, um, as it was announced, is really about the terms and the possibilities of the concept of rewilding. Uh, really thinking about the larger question of how can we uh, make curating a rewilding practice or otherwise put how can we make uh, curating and museum practices sites for rewilding, right? And um, as you will see, this um, in entails a number of different issues, the question of rewilding and of course, how do we rather incorporate it as a methodology for curatorial practices or how perhaps as Sebastian uh, will touch upon how it has already been incorporated and we haven't been able to identify it as such, uh, which is something that excites me very much about this conversation. Now, uh, and we, uh, while we wait for a little bit more people to join us, I just wanted to say that Sebastian and I met uh, last year, it was actually almost a year ago, uh, in Hong Kong during Parasites International Conference and Curatorial Workshop, uh, in which Sebastian gave a very interesting, thought-provoking um, talk in, in addressing this very issue, uh, among other things, of course, uh, and that it were actually very inspiring to me and to continue thinking about the possibilities of the term um, and resignifying also term from its very um, conventional connotations as, as a practice of, of wilderness, of setting and trying to return to nature into an untouched, uh, authentic or original state of being that has not been in essence touched by humans, right? So, and this is exactly where the question of rewilding becomes quite problematic because all of these terms of authenticity, of wilderness are actually uh, quite man-made. Uh, these are projected uh, uh, by humans with having had this, this larger connotation of, of, of nature as something that is pristine, that is untouched, that doesn't move, also doesn't evolve in time. Um, so, so we cannot actually go back in time to rewild uh, natural settings. Um, and so there is this larger connotation of the unnaturalness of, of the wilderness, of the unnaturalness of, of nature, uh, which is really interesting because it gets really much, um, I mean, it's very much well addressed in questions of conservation and um, nature with conservation and is rather or, or other relationship with cultural or artistic conservation. And in preparation for this talk and seeing the relationship that exists between wilderness or rewilding, more specifically, and restor uh, restoration, uh, not nature restoration, uh, we actually posted in the collective rewilding, if you're following us, our term post uh, just two days ago, uh, precisely to signal uh, some of the problematics that exist with the question of preservation, uh, with holding something in, in place uh, or holding nature in place, uh, and what it connotations it also has for the ways in which cultural institutions have also uh, attempted to, you know, also hold architectural, artistic, or cultural artifacts in place, right, in conserving them for the future. So there is also this ra like larger association of conservation for, uh, as being something that is done for for future generations, right, for survival and endurance in the future. Um, however, for us at Collective Rewilding, um, it means slightly something, something slightly different. And we wanted to rehash a little bit of that uh, definition or that take that we have been um, thinking about as a segue into Sebastian's also very unique and different take on the concept. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start with, with this definition, um, again, to signal uh, the, the, the foundations that are being uh, suggested by the very question of preservation and nature and, uh, and the role that culture or cultural institutions may have when, when it comes to, to rethinking the question of rewilding. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, so the concept of rewilding emerges in the early 1990s preservation discussions and, uh, sorry, and is first introduced by the environmentalist uh, Dave Foreman. He uses the term to talk about wilderness restoration of native species and processes. The term is still predominantly used in an environmental context and it has multiple connotations that usually share a long-term aim of restoring and maintaining wilderness while reducing the past, present, or future impact of humans on nature. The process implies returning non-wild cultivated areas back to wild uh, natural states. As we engage with rewilding, uh, we're nevertheless conscious of the problems surrounding a uh, romanticized ideology of the wild as it is often fetishized from a historical Eurocentric perspective. Especially because it is also seemingly implies a rivalry of wilderness versus culture, rerouting culture as progress and nature as an idealized, permanent, determinated state that is somehow positioned in the past or the exotic far away. However, we're very interested in the possibilities of the term and it allows us to think of the shared responsibilities human and non-human agents have to restore collect, uh, to collect, like, collective sustaining communities. It is unimaginable to think rewilding uh, without considering the social, cultural, economic, and political dimensions uh, of its process. That is why, for us, it means repositioning the human as part of nature, instead of its conqueror that dominates the surrounding environment into submission to be bent at the will. Uh, in other words, we're thinking with the term as a possibility to question art institutional practices, to deconstruct the very foundation of culture as a man-made superior model, and to acknowledge the importance of holistic systems as alternative forms of structuring the institution. Rewilding for us suggests getting insights that can inform adaptive management and sustainable development for artistic projects that make us accountable to the multiple worlds we inhabit. So as a way to kind of rehash that definition, um, I think that for us, a collective rewilding, the notion of um, this notion really speaks to the larger idea of adaptation, of collective flourishing, of rethinking institutional practice and culture at large as something that is, is, is as a becoming with the natural, uh, but it doesn't idealize, it doesn't romanticize it, it doesn't think of this, this, this necessity of of um, holding or maintaining the natural in one state of being because you know, nature is always evolving. And in part of that, um, I think that, 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 that notion that the natural is also uh, quite adaptive, quite transforming, quite resilient is one of the things that for us methodologically, it speaks a lot about how to uh, face the world in crisis. Uh, because if you have been also following a little bit of what we are doing at the collective, we have been quite much guided by this larger idea of how to curate for a broken world. So amid a world in crisis, what does it mean to, to produce um, artistic projects? What does it mean to, to engage with curation and museum practice um, in the face of so many um, like multiple and multiplying, so uh, it seems like multiplying emergencies. So <laughs> with that, um, I wanted to invite Sebastian to tell us a little bit more about how he came uh, to this term, what it means for him, and maybe a couple of examples uh, where he thinks that this, this notion of rewilding has been uh, quite explicit or has been already dealt with in interesting ways. Hi, uh, Sarah, first of all, thank you for bringing me to this uh, IG platform <laughs> so we can have a little argument about the term and its uh, connotations. Uh, I love glossaries and lexicons, so the, 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 the way of like expanding our vocabulary and like naming things, it's, I think is crucial and uh, I think our linguistic toolbox uh, requires some, some calibrating or recalibrating. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very problematic prefix, yeah? Re, remake, redo, restart, you know, it suggests that, uh, you know, the, there was something in the past which we want to kind of come back to, or, you know, this is like this make the earth great again kind of attitude, you know, <laughs> rewilding, you know, like, oh, those, this great planet with dinosaurs and, you know, all those gigantic plants, you know, we should just, you know, get rid of this uh, 
you know, species which is uh, polluting the, the, the planet. But uh, I, I will try to kind of relate this, this prefix uh, re with uh, uh, the other problematic prefix, which is post. <laughs> and I think there are like two uh, very kind of... Uh, misleading uh, kind of linguistic terms, you know, which suggest, uh, you know, the expire date of certain issues or like it re suggests something which we should be sentimental about. So, but I think, you know, like uh, it's, it's a completely different thing. I think when we met in Hong Kong a year ago, imagine, you know, it was a year ago, uh, you know, before the pandemic, before, you know, all those fires in Australia, Siberia, uh, United States, before the Belarusian revolution, you know, like everything, you know, like it's, it's, it's like the planet is, is literally like burning, you know. So it, I think it's, 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 it's uh, I would suggest we start with a little, like a very tangible example, you know, just to, trying to anchor this, this, uh, this situation, this, this, uh, really dramatic moment with uh, curatorial practice, you know, like with one exhibition. So, so uh, I, I promised to, to, to say a few words about the uh, current project, about current exhibition, which we just closed down and to kind of uh, uh, also position myself, you know, on the planet. I'm speaking to you from Warsaw, Poland. Uh, this is uh, a uh, uh, former... Uh, bar uh, in, a, in a block of flats from the 70s, uh, our temporary headquarters. And uh, this, is, this is where I'm sitting now and uh, with this beautiful mosaic with uh, a lot of like uh, plastic and uh, broken glass, very strange thing, which we discovered removing the wall here. But this is, this is, the, this is exactly the, 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 the place uh, where we you know, use as a kind of headquarters. But... Uh, this year we opened an exhibition, a long-term project, one of the iterations of, uh, yeah, it's, I would say it's, it's still the same exhibition, which I keep doing for many years, you know, failing and trying mm -hmm. to, you know, do it better, working with more or less like the same constellation of artists, trying to expand. But uh, basically I'm very much interested in this, uh, in the term of land art, you know, what you can do with land art as a genre, as this kind of specific, almost extinct species, uh, when you try to uh, decolonize it, like demodernize it, and so on and so on, when you try to think about it, about, uh, to try about like a certain, certain attitude uh, towards the, the, the planet, so it doesn't have to be uh, yeah, Western. It doesn't have to be white and male as we are used to, when we know the canon of of, of land art. But uh, yeah, the, like this this the exhibition which was titled "The Penumbral Age: Art in the Time of uh, Planetary Crisis" was focused on this continuity. And I think when we when we talk about about uh, rewilding or like uh, post artistic practices, which I touch upon later, it's 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 very important to to think about like our legacies, there are like many legacies and many mm -hmm. heritages which we can somehow relate to. And they're like, it's our common legacy. I mean like environmental organizations, uh, feminist organizations, like uh, anti-fascist uh, 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 groups. We have something in common. We have our uh, legacy, which is very often, which very often materialized as artworks. They are very kind of difficult to kind of capture, to mesialize. They are very sometimes uh, marginal, obscure practices, but I think they are quite crucial. So this, in this exhibition, which we were just about to open before the lockdown, uh, we tried to uh, kind of rewrite a fragment of, of art history and give uh, certain, uh, uh, certain organizations as Extinction Rebellion of, of, or, or, or uh, um, uh, s s Friday's strikes uh, a, a platform. So to use the, this is, yeah, this is the, exactly the image, I can see it. So this is, this is an image from, 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 the, from the museum, this is an exhibition view, but 
basically the exhibition was was structured as a as a kind of uh, meeting point as a gathering point for for uh, environmental organizations where artworks were treated as footnotes so to speak uh, showing this 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 continuity since 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 1960s 1969 that's how the the story started and then um we quickly discovered, you know, like when we reopened 11 uh, weeks later after like having all those uh, fantastic works, you know, like trapped in the crates, that, that the exhibition is about something else. You know, like uh, after, after uh, the lockdown, we kind of discovered that this is, oh no, this is not like a catalog of, of environmentally conscious gestures. This is about how we look at art, you know, in the times of, of, of planetary crisis. So it doesn't have to be like that, uh, you know, obvious, you know, it doesn't have to relate to certain environmental issues. It can be very conceptual, very abstract. And um, yeah, if you can shift to the next image, I, I selected for you five examples. I, I will just say a few sentences about each of them. No, the, the Bonnie Orasherk, the one, the, the woman sitting on a, kind of construction site. Okay, but we can start from this one. This is like, this is, of course, uh, just, just, just a few sentences because I selected them to kind of illustrate this kind of rewilding debate or argument. Uh, this is, this is uh, a photo from, from John Latham's archive and John Latham was the founder of one, uh, one of the most uh, experimental and, 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 and meaningful uh, artistic groups called APG, Art Displacement Group, which is uh, actually a fantastic way to talk about rewilding, about like moving the, from this friendly but uh, kind of uh, predictable habitat environment of a museum to other spheres, to other fields, to other, other kind of uh, artworks, because there are many, as we know. And, uh, and uh, the, the idea was to, to plug in to, to host artists in non-artistic environments, like uh, offices, private uh, companies, uh, uh, hospitals even. And, uh, and, and APG was uh, dealing with this, 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 this idea of, of an incidental person. This is how they call it, you know, like an artist is, 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 is being employed, is being hired by a hospital, for example, or like a municipality to, do, uh, to, to help make decisions. That's uh, a, quite a, you know, uh, uh, quite a task, you know, it's not about like producing artworks. It's, it's not about like uh, materializing your ideas in this non-artistic environment. It's about uh, really uh, uh, making feasibility studies, you know, like uh, facilitating certain processes, you know, taking part in some, some, some panel discussions. So John Latham, who, who established APG with, with Barbara Steveni, he was employed by the Scottish Office, uh, Office for Development. Mm -hmm. And he had a task, what you can see in the image are like, coal heaps, uh, like 19th century uh, 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 mounds, which were created by excavation of the hard coal. Uh, and uh, the idea was to, to, uh, to have an artist who is, who is doing something with it, you know, like proposing uh, kind of reshaping them or like making something uh, fancy, something, uh, or just removing them and uh, recycling the materials. So they were really stuck with this idea. And, I think what he did was brilliant. He worked with the uh, very legal status of those of those hills. Mm. They are they they they've been there since 1860s. So we can imagine like this uh, rich, lush vegetation. You know all those like uh, you know uh, species of plants and animals who inhabited the, the, those hills. And he changed the status. Uh, so they are like formally protected using this ancient monuments and archaeological areas act. And that was the thing, you know, yeah. just changing the state. I think it's a brilliant idea. Nothing happened, you know, like it was just, uh, I think we are suffering from, the, from a serious deficit of imagination. And that's why we can somehow feed on those like, you know, proposals from the past. Let's have a look at the other example. Yeah. So, um, look at the women sitting on the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other example which I want to, pre to present is, is Bonnie Ora Sherk. And uh, 
uh, this is this is Robert Morris. Also, like it's a bad example, but uh, yeah, it's, I, I just wanted to say something because if we yeah, the sequence is not really important. You know, it's uh, we want we had this opportunity to to show some examples of a kind of hardcore conceptual artworks. Uh, never materialized some of them very conceptual but uh showing also like kind of bad examples of this uh you know impact of this hyper agency of human humans uh humans you know on the planet and this is this is you cannot see it probably on your telephones but this is a one of those crazy ideas uh, from 1969 uh, uh, proposed by 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 Robert Morris uh this is one of the one of the uh, sculptures the one uh, the one depicted here it's uh, it's actually it's a it's a set of of jet engines like plane engines buried on a desert activated and creating this 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 uh, monument which consists of gigantic cloud of pollution so imagine, you know, proposing something like that, you know, like you're creating this donut-shaped uh, 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 smoke as a as, as, an, as a land artwork, you know. Mm -hmm. So so I think we we also touched upon some some of those like really problematic issues, you know, like the, those like Western artists fantasizing about living in trace, you know, like competing with the natural forces. Okay, one more maybe. Uh, you see, is this the one? No, I didn't upload very well. Oh, this is this is interesting. This is an interesting uh, proposal. Uh, not very rational, but I think we should also like look at those non-artistic or, or post-artistic uh, gestures. This is a group of monks from Japan uh, in nineteen in, uh, exactly in nineteen seventy. A group of uh, Buddhist monks like left the, 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 their, their, their monasteries and they decided to uh, travel around Europe, uh, sorry, around Japan and pray in front of some factories, trying to kill the bosses of those factories, you know, mm -hmm. like having, using those so-called death mantras. And it was a reaction to, uh, to environmental pollution and mass poisoning and new diseases, new pandemics, such as, uh, such as Itai Itai, which was uh, actually uh, the uh, cadmium uh, uh, pollution of the, of the lungs. So I think it was quite, uh, as a performance, as a, as, a, as a political gesture, as a, as a, as a happening, uh, you know, the, 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 the group of monks activating those old scrolls from the 14th century, which are being kind of, illegal, I think it's quite a, quite a, um, uh, you know, quite an operation when it comes to your imagination, what you can use, which forces you can use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is an example also from the exhibition. We had like uh, some, some, some documentation from Mitsutoshi Hanaga, this uh, fantastic uh, Japanese photographer who actually joined this, this, uh, this group of monks later. That's fascinating. I think that the, especially, I mean, the ways in which, like you say, there's a lot of resignification of concepts or ways of applying or, uh, I want to say, instrumentalizing some of the, mm. the question of mantras, of praying, of maybe not so much ritual, but of, of looking and position the, the natural uh, in a way that underscores uh, precisely these, the larger divide between culture and nature, right? Which has always been, um, quite intention. And one of the questions or one of the issues that comes up in, in the larger notion of preservation that's associated with rewilding is precisely the extension of who is the threat. Is nature a threat to humans? Is the human also a threat to the environment? And that this is a quite interesting paradox that is continuously always kind of undermined. Uh, because when we think, for example, of the um, uh, level of the sea, sea levels rising, right? Mm -hmm. We think of the, of, of the sustainability and um, like capacity of, of or the threat for a coastal city to continue uh, leaving amidst the, this threat of uh, waters rising, right? But it's a threat that it was also occasioned by, by human uh, agency, right? So there's this always this tension of uh, who is actually the threat to whom and, and in what degrees. 
And so okay. I, I see that in the, um, I feel like this is very interesting because I'm, I didn't attend the exhibition, sadly, but it must be really interesting that in a world in crisis to face some of these different perspectives on the natural, on um, industrial pollution or capital. It's also about like finding kind of unexpected allies, you know, like mm -hmm. if you can like, uh, you know, find some like common ground with some religious groups you know, we try it very hard. There is this, this, this group, Catholics for Climate, for example, in Poland, you know, but this is like the maximum which you can get, you know. Yeah. But uh, I think those, uh, you know, spiritual and, uh, you know, think about, for example, those, those uh, hippie, new agey collectives from the 60s and 70s as the Slovenian Ojo group. They, mm -hmm. uh, they, are, they, they, they were fantastic and they kind of shifted from conceptual art to this, Eastern European, very poetic, very subtle uh, kind of iteration of land art. And they ended up establishing a, a hippie commune, like basically uh, uh, the Sempas family. So praying, uh, you know, drawing together, milking cows, you know, cultivating vegetables. It was a part of the same process. You know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 I think there are so many kind of runaways uh, artists who kind of migrated from art to agriculture, farming, you know, environmental groups and so on. And I think it's, it's also like an example of rewilding, you know, you're just getting rid of the, of the regulations and uh, protocols, you know, of, uh, of a museum. Yes, and that's actually what I wanted to get at. And it's like, so, you know, museum institutions, um, you know, I pick, I precisely the spaces to have these conversations, mm -hmm. and especially the historic work that you have done is quite um, outstanding. Precisely because it reminds us that we have there are precedents that this is not new or it's not the first time it's happening, right? Um, and that it has been an ongoing conversation for mm -hmm. several for several decades, if not forever. Precisely because of this tension. I mean, you know, going back to the, the romanticism, right? There, there are very foundational moments in which the natural becomes an important trope. In fact, wilderness is basically coined, um, right? In, in, the, in this moment of thinking also at the, like at the site or in this, um, at the moment of emergence of like growth or urban growth or um, population growth, right? And so there are very moments, various moments throughout history when we have this, this, this particular kind of um, environmental concern and when nature also becomes a trope of, 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 of I don't know, like, like a desired space for, for existence. Yeah. And this is where, again, it becomes um, dangerously also romanticized or idealized. And one of the things that for us in, at Rewilding, a Collective Rewilding, uh, is we have been thinking about is precisely how do we denaturalize a space of of the of the romantic while also maintaining an environmental consciousness? How do we enter, like you said, in the association or affiliation uh, with with the environment in a way that also accounts for for its uh, for how volatile it is? Because one of the things that has been really predominant through these these last several crises in the last mm. year or so um, has been precisely this increasing sense of shared vulnerability. Mm. The vulnerability mm. of the environment, our vulnerability as, as human societies, and the many vulnerabilities that across the board and how different they are, how wide ranging they are. So the question is really, how do we come to terms with this vulnerability? How do we curate and how do we help adapt institutions to help us cope with this sense of vulnerability, to move with it as opposed to against it, right? As opposed to building even bigger fortress or, you know, just precisely just setting up a particular kind of critique. How do we come one with, with the crisis in a way that allows us to become a bit more adaptive? Um, yeah, so in, in that sense, the question would be, um, like, how did you see the exhibition also, or, or perhaps the community that, and the people that attended the exhibition, how did they respond to, to these larger views of, of nature, of land art? Um, and if there were something else within the curatorial or pedagogical education programming that in, uh, enabled or that kind of relationship? Yeah, there is something in the very DNA of uh this monster which is called contemporary art which is uh, being fueled by this you know notion of novelty you know like it's it's i think this is the first thing to get rid of you know when you are trying to you know like do kind of let's say ecologically kind of conscious uh mm -hmm. exhibition it's because you know we are like 
touching the surface, you know, there, there, there's, everybody talks about like recycling, you know, like plastic bottles in the museum, you know, like printing or not printing, you know, like car carbon footprint of, 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 of our websites and so on. You know, like, I think this is like a marginal discussion, you know, like it's, you should do it as, as, a, as a citizen, as a, as, as a human, you know, like everybody knows that, you know, like you shouldn't buy like water in plastic bottles but this is not the museum discussion you know like it's we know about it i think there is something really uh kind of non-ecological in the way we operate uh, i mean when it comes to like you know material and human resources when you f feed your institution with this kind of extravagance this excess this this newness you know like this is like it's all about like finding new things you know like it's about proposing new ideas you know new concepts you know discovering new new names you know like being first being like the most radical and and, and this is quite problematic because then you know you know it's it's imagine imagine like a kind of more so to speak, monogamous relationship with certain subjects, you know, like the, 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 the massive danger of this uh, discussion, which we are having in, in, in museums and in institutions is that ecology, climate crisis might become like one of those thoughts, one of those turns, you know, like in art, you know, and we'll be done with it. You know, like it's, 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 it's this, is, this, is, this is quite problematic. So I think the, the, the main thing uh, when, you, when you do such an exhibition is not only about, you know, like, okay, collecting those fantastic works and, you know, like showing how artists are sensitive and, 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 and conscious and how brilliant they are about proposing those solutions, but it's also about the way you use your resources, you know, I mean, also like, you know, your ideas, you know, if you stick to certain, you know, ideas, if you cultivate them somehow, you know, in the Polish language, we don't make art, we cultivate art, we grow art. So I think it's a very um, uh, kind of uh, unconscious, but a very nice uh, linguistic coincidence. Cultivation is a special relationship with something. Yeah? It's like you have to water it, you know, like it's, uh, yeah. you have your experience. Yeah, it's about care, it's about um, uh, failures, you know, like it's might, uh, it might dry up and uh, there are those moments of hibernation and lush vegetation and so on. So I think when you, when you, when you cultivate certain process, processes when you let them grow it's a different you know there are diff other processes you know it's 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 something it's something else so so it's also about competition because if you want to have like new things you have to compete mm -hmm. and this is like a very harsh environment you know art institutions contemporary art institutions it's a very um, kind of greedy uh, creature you know like uh, feeding on those you know like new things new ideas new people but you know, like there are very down to earth examples, you know, maybe you can exhibit the same piece which you had, you know, like in your last show, you know, because you want to stress up the importance of the work or you want to, you know, like sustain the special relationship with the artist or you want to put it in a different context. And, uh, you know, they, I, so like so many great exhibitions, you know, like dedicated uh, to, to, to climate issues recently in Poland, you know, like the Museum of Art in Łódź is, is fantastic. And, uh, and I discovered many things there, you know, and, uh, you know, like according to, I don't know, art critics, you know, we should compete, you know, like we should uh, dig deeper, you know, show something else. But I was like so touched by some words and say, yeah, why not to show them in my exhibition, you know, like to kind of accentuate, to stress up that they are important gestures, you know, like, uh, you know, Agnes Danish, you know, of course, how can you like, you know, skip her, <laughs> you know, like, so, so, so I think it's not only about, uh, you know, recycling materials, it's about like recycling ideas, you know, using your own resources, looking into your storage room, you know, like, uh, you know, look, working with your 
team more, you know, like engaging with the educational departments, you know, like thinking about how to communicate the exhibition, use it as an apparatus, you know, because this is, this is uh, something which I, I came up uh, uh, today, you know, like thinking about our discussion, what to say, you know, like how to deal with this rewilding issue. And I came up with this, uh, maybe stupid, but I think it's quite catchy metaphor of, uh, of a zoo, of a zoo, zoological garden, you know, like the, 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 the it's, you know, it's, a, it's an old relative of a museum, you know, it's an institutional relative. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, like the difference between living in the jungle and living in the zoo is quite striking. You know, it's uh, uh, especially for visitors, you know, like when somebody wants to see, uh, uh, you know, a parrot, you know, it's, 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 it's there, it's kind of abstracted, yeah, it's in a cage. It probably, it lives longer, yeah, it's, it's being fed, it's uh, being taken care of, it has like, a, you know, do a doctor checks it like every year and so on, so it lives longer and it's easy to see it's easy to kind of abstract it from the non uh, kind of biological background. You know, yes. it's, it's in a cage and it has a label, it has a caption even, you know, it has like a description about, you know, like certain like behaviors and so on. When you escape from a zoo, <laughs> you know, when you start to live in a jungle, uh, you might uh, disappear, you might camouflage yourself like mm -hmm. perfectly in the background. And I think about all those practitioners about artists who kind of as APG example you know like you are starting to use your artistic uh, skills and competences and imagination in non-artistic kind of environment in habitat which is not a museum then yeah it's a disaster for the museum curators and for the visitors because you cannot see that part by the way it's a, it's the, uh, I read this most amazing article yesterday about gray parrots uh, in, in, in England. You know, they started to swear at people, you know, and so they had to be like uh, in Lincolnshire Zoo in England. And, uh, you know, five parrots started to, 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 you know, to say fuck off to the visitors. And they, so they decided to separate them because they have such a bad influence on each other. You know, they were really harsh. So, uh, so the idea was that they might pick some like natural sounds in other places in the zoo. Mm -hmm. But you know, what is unnatural in saying fuck off to humans, you know, like imagine, you know, like this, the other species are fin finally saying that it's brilliant, it's amazing, it's epic. You know? Yeah, <laughs> so, but coming back to this, uh, you know, like the, 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 the zoo uh, kind of metaphor, you know, it's, it's when you want to go to more, to a more art historical references, it's like this, uh, you know, Robert, Smithson's uh, site and non-site thing. You know, yeah. like this is so simple. You know, like you have something which is linguistically edited, like the white cube, mm -hmm. and something which is organically growing and changing, so you cannot really recognize the boundaries of it. Mm -hmm. And this is non-site. So uh, having an artistic practice in a site it's like a zoo. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's there. It's strict. It's, 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 it's being uh, uh, labeled. But uh, moving somewhere like, you know, uh, even running away, you know, to other fields, to others, you know, like w galaxies even, because they are like galaxies, it means that you are getting wild. You know, and you're like getting rid of the, of those regulations and uh, okay. protocols. Yes, and that's really interesting. I feel like you bring very, very interesting things together. On the one hand, the question of behavior, the question of visibility, um, and the question of, of language or verbosity, mm -hmm. right? And I think that they're all at the crux of thinking uh, methodologically about the question of rewilding and the role of institutions in perhaps being permeated by a, a larger rewilding a mentality. And uh, what I mean by that is that um, precisely, like I guess I feel, and, and this is going back to some of the examples that I hope you touch upon about this, this, these examples that historically of artists that engage in, um, 
you know, grassroots organizations that have become environmental activists and they made that part of their artwork uh, without there being an artwork as a result, as a product mm. of it, right? So it, I think it ties up very well with your question or your larger premise of post art, which I hope you will develop in a second. But most importantly, the um, this question of how do we transform, like because in 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 redrawing, in going back to museum collections, in in quote unquote uh, recycling the works of art, so that we don't have to always construct the new. Um, what is really interesting about that is precisely, um, as you also signaled at the beginning of the talk, that our perspective shifts over time, right? That we see them with a different light and we understand them in in a different kinds of different kinds of context or in this case emergencies, urgencies, right? Um, and so it's really interesting to see, for example, historically our relationship to 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 wilderness, to nature, to landscape painting, right? And how the, the subject position has radically transformed over time, right? Um, and to 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 where that subject position or not, because sometimes we just continue. We're so subsumed in, work, in modes and conventions of representation of the natural that we no longer ask ourselves where where is the human in that representation? Where is me as a viewer, as a situated viewer um, or subject with you know? the entirety of my body positioned by the artist in this representation. Um, I'm, well, albeit I may not, of course, be inside the picture. Uh, I, I am still being, a, being engulfed in a particular kind of view or visual mm. framing that where, where I think visitors need to become a little bit more aware or conscious about you know, also asking where, is, where am I doing the looking from? And, and that's precisely our, our, our place today. Mm. And so it's, it's really interesting to think about uh, behavior too, right? So in, in Collective Rewilding and in the, in the uh, Instagram, we've done a lot of term posts, not only one on preservation that I, that I talked about earlier, but we also did one before that on spectatorship and another one on uh, authenticity, which are two terms that I, I invite everyone to maybe consult after this talk to really think about the ways in which all of these terms are quite in, entangled, right? Um, the questions in which, or, or forms in which questions of uh, cultural uh, preservation, architectural backdrops, for example, become ways in which we enter a picture or enter a landscape, like, which is, the, for example, the case in Venice, which is one of the, the projects that we have been developing, um, and has a place in that kind of montage, right? Um, so the museum no longer has, or in special cities, it doesn't necessarily have a distinction between the interior and the exterior, or how you call it, um, like the, not the forest, but the, um, uh, like the wild versus like the, the zoo kind of thing. <laughs> the zoo situation, yes, yeah, yes, the um, cage, yeah, yeah. That, site, non site thing, yeah, the that's the tension, the yeah. It has been built as, as a landscape, it yeah. has been built as a picture. Uh, in which we're constituted to walk mm. in and out of, mm. right? And so when we see those representations in the museum, it would be interesting to also ask, how do they differ? How do they get us out of the montage? How do they also challenge or question uh, our capacity to relate to not only the natural, but the space around us and everything in it uh, differently? How can we create new relationships mm. um, that move away from this modern premise of of the city also as a as a or the, the citizen, the urban viewer as, as this um, spectator of the city, right? As this person that just moves around the space as a view, as a passive viewer um, and, and into an active form of viewership as accountable to, uh, responsible uh, to, and of course, inside the picture, but in, in the terms of being um, very much entangled with that environment. Um, so yeah, and so again, to go back to this the relationship between <laughs> behavior, um, verbality, and, and vision, I think they're pretty much entangled in, in the way in which uh, art projects in the past have already alluded to, to that relationship of that ways of expanding the museum site outside of its infrastructure into other spaces, but more importantly, in how these other spaces or how the spaces within the museum you know, when they enter the museum as representations of the artwork, as documentation of the performance, how do they help change behavior? How, do they, I mean, that's a big question, uh, can they uh, also be um, reshaped or repositioned in a way that 
precisely gets the question of not only how people view and absorb works of art within the museum, but how do they view and behave around those representations, knowing that there is no real division between the interiority of that curated space and the realities of the, of the exterior uh, space. Yeah, basically, you're asking the biggest question in the history of art does art work you know like does it has an impact you know does it change the people's attitudes and uh you know recently uh an artist which i really admire uh olga michinska she she gave me uh some like uh, hints um uh, you know she she's this kind of uh, an artist uh, who does everything by herself. She, she, actually, she, she's in the in the in the farm now, but she, you know, does uh, you know like renovations of houses and everything. You know, it's a very kind of down to earth practice. But she was recommending this uh, uh, book by uh, a North American cognitivist and philosopher, Alva Noe, which is called Strange Tools and. Uh, and I think, you know, like I've been dealing with this, uh, with this question of, of, of the possibility of treating art, you know, as a kind of toolbox for shaping the reality for, for a long time. And uh, this, this book was quite, quite brilliant because it's, it's really, you know, it's, there is nothing special about art, you know, about artworks, according to, the, to, the, to this writer, you know, to Alva Noah. It's, it's one of the tools, it's like, you know, hammers, screwdrivers, you know, like telephones, video installations, you know, conceptual artworks and scissors and so on. It's, they all help us to kind of adapt, you know, and, and they, they, they help us to understand and you can do things with them, you know. So uh, there is a discussion among, you know, scientists nowadays you know like you know what is the problem with all those you know like statistics you know like with all those charts and you know like data and uh, you know that's it, that's pretty problematic you know like the more you look at those you know like raising charts increasing charts with the methane uh, yeah. you know like increase and you know like the loss of biodiversity and everything you know does it really help you to that's does it motivate you yeah it's like you know it's or or if you know that such things are happening you're getting more depressed and more kind of paralyzed you know by the horror of all those processes when you uh, uh reject all those information when you believe that uh, you know there is nothing wrong about like uh, you know uh, global warming and uh, it's better for our you know farming as some of the polish politicians uh, claim you know you won't get you know like persuaded by the scientific data that's why uh, uh, scientists are looking uh, at our you know into looking into our toolboxes you know and uh, reaching to those strange tools and this is quite a well uh, analyzed and well kind of uh, researched uh, uh, psychological process. You know, like it's, it's not about uh, pure kind of propaganda. It's about creating certain emotions, you know, like fear, you know, like, like, like the, 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 the feeling of loss. The, the 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 feeling of uh, falling in love with something or somebody you know this is what you can uh, generate uh, you know writing poems you know like making you know beautiful you know video artworks and uh, making conceptual gestures you know you can create this feeling and uh, and this is like uh, this is like a vaccination you know like uh, you, you you can be vaccinated and getting a kind of, uh, and, uh, and being immune to, to those, you know, like conspiracy theories, when you, for example, stumble against some weird, you know, like uh, very hermetic video installation as a child, which deals with the loss of biodiversity, or which is just, you know, like, I don't know, Vivian Sutter's like uh, thing, you know, like just depicting the, the natural phenomena. You know, so so I think it's 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 I kind of believe in 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 this uh, apparatus which we have refined 
you know it's 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 even when you look at the 19th century paintings you know like landscape paintings you know like it's 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 you know the industrial revolution is there it's it's documented you know it's 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 really all those uh, crazy psychedelic you know twilights and uh, strange uh, forms of clouds and you know you know it's 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 john raskin you know like like he was analyzed as the, those changes you know just just looking at the paintings from the last few centuries you know art can document things but art can also like uh, you know, triggers and certain processes. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like those monks, you know, just praying for the death of the factory's uh, boss. We, you know, we, cannot, we cannot prove it, you know, like even though they claim they killed Roosevelt before, but uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, my, my answer is, you know, like I'm not sure about it, you know, like I don't know it really works, but uh, I think there is, you know, it's not one of the last kind of agencies which we can like address, you know, like, yeah. No, this... no, with you and I don't think that, I mean, the question of behavior is not as, as much as to say, can't people go from point A to point B, but more so how can an institution become, and cultural practices in general, a bit more mm. active with, with perhaps, yeah, thinking of rewilding as this provocation for mm. reformulating these relationships, for rethinking those affects. Uh, because it, you're right, what, what really changes is really our views of, the, of, the, of nature. Uh, you know, because we come from seeing it as, as well, we have always seen it as, as wild and... Uh, yeah, we just, you know, we also like woke up, you know, discovering that the nature doesn't exist. That the thing, exactly. You know? <laughs> Really, it's really think also, yeah, like you say, these fictions, these unnaturalness, how much we project onto it, particular kinds of ideologies that have everything to do with the future. Like, how do we characterize the possibility of life in the future uh, precisely through, through the rhetoric of crisis that is very much paralyzing? Mm. So it is about precisely, yeah, like the, that discourse of how do we live in crisis so that crisis doesn't become a weapon against us, doesn't become this... Um, you know, this, this thing that paralyzes our thinking and makes us think of this kind of doom, end of the world scenario, uh, where we're just going to be, you know, it's kind of the end of, of time, right? Um, and, and, and into something that is a little bit more productive, but it's productive not in the ways of overcoming crisis, but mm -hmm. of adapting to it, of becoming resilient to it, and to see historically, as you said, I, I think this is a very important issue, which is so I, I like to emphasize, to see historically how uh, mm -hmm. climate injustice and um, violence has been also in, uh, dealt with in the past. Because it's not, I mean, I am say climate injustice is something that has a human agency on it, but you know, the, the tension between nature and human, but more importantly, culture and nature, right? A culture as this place where the natural becomes uh, signified, becomes, mm. right? Um, so much more meaning is given to the natural through the cultural sphere. And so the role of the, of the museum in, in shaping and helping transform also those cultural connotations that we have of nature. You know, our friend, uh, psychologist who deals with uh, climate crisis a lot and with this, uh, you know, feeling of, of uh, loss and, uh, you know, death and extinction, she, she told us that, uh, you know, you guys are lucky. You have those, you know, those, those, those tools to keep you like uh keep you in the state of mourning mm -hmm. you know it's it's because in our like modern you know contemporary societies we cannot stand death you know in our presence so we kind of mask it you know with uh other things you know but then the death the or the dead are coming back you know like and they are kind of this guys or something else they are like you know in those costumes and they possess us you know so so you know like watching those weird films you know like reading poetry literature and you know like which is dealing with the climate crisis you can stay with this uh, in this in this in this moment and you cannot stay there forever of course but you have to be there for a while uh -huh. you know it's like like saying farewell to somebody okay you know you cannot say like you know like uh, my relative is gone and so i'm going to party for like seven weeks and uh, they will i will be over no you have to like sit next to the coffin you know like for the whole night and the uh, very next day you will be fine you know like you will you will go to the next stage you know you cannot just turn your head you know like you cannot close your eyes so i think this is one of the 
kind of uh, sad, uh, you know, like uh, issues that kind of, you know, like uh, tasks of the of the of, of artists nowadays, you know, to keep us in this uh, kind of mournful condition, which I find like psychologically quite uh, convincing, you know. No, no. <laughs> Because, you know, how can you deal with it? You know, like it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, this is the end, you know. Yes. <laughs> the end is near, you know. <laughs> the end is near, but I think that mourning, and I think there was also, and we also have four more minutes, but the question of mourning and death uh, was also something that became really prominent at the beginning of the pandemic uh, as a way of reconciling all of that anxiety that we were dealing with, right? To, to think of it as, mm. as a form of mourning. To, for the things that are transforming. And that's really why we are insisting uh, so much in the question of adaptation is to think also of transformation, yeah. right? Uh, as something that, you know, certain processes um, die, you know. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. With death, uh, you know, like evoking the Haraway kind of, how to live and die well, um, how to evoke these this better processes of, yeah, uh, yeah. And not, like, and again, to go back to the question of rewilding and its connotations with preservation, that is not really seeking just preserving things for the future as a state of, of mm. being that is always stagnated and um, right, or like in, in, in a sense of original or authentic that does not really exist. And to, to move with the waves and to move with the transformations, uh, albeit really pa painful or really devastating uh, in ways that can help us evolve, right? Evolve in the, in the metaphysical, <laughs> evolve, right? As a society that thinks with, mm. the, the, with evolution, with transformation, with adaptation, with resilience, more so than with trying to hold on to, you know, systems or, you know, structures or institutions that in, in this fact sometimes today may feel quite um, inadequate to continue, yeah. right? Or continue responding to our environment. But you know, there's like a quite, a, uh, you know, accurate illustration of this kind of loss and death and mourning process when it comes to museums and institutions, you know, like IMMA, the Irish Museum of Modern Art uh, has been transformed into a potential mortuary, you know, after the lockdown, you know, so this, the, you know, the white cube, which is, you know, like the, 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 this building, which is separated by this green belt, so it's relatively safe, it's air conditioned, was recognized as a, as a structure for, you know, corpses actually. You know, so, so it didn't happen, but I think it's uh, something to think about, you know, when it comes to kind of rewilding or like morphing into something else, you know. Of course, there are like also optimistic examples as the Queen's Museum, which have, uh, has become the food pantry yeah, recently, or, uh, you know, or this like fantastic uh, uh, historical example of Malmo, uh, Malmo Museum in Sweden, which became the refugee camp in 1945, you know, wow. for... The prisoners coming from, from concentration camps, you know, like uh, Ernst Fischer, the director, just opened the gates and they, they were like squatting in the museum for six months, cooking, sleeping there uh, among those artworks. You know, there are like photos of, of Polish uh, ex-prisoners uh, uh, making a kind of uh, shrine using those holy statues from the museum collection as a place to pray in the museum. You know, so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, rewilding might get us in very interesting places, you know. That's right. We already have one more minute, so I don't know that I, I think it's also a great way to close our conversation. And hopefully that this will be the beginning of a lot of many conversations on the topic, which seems to have so much, um, you know, connotations and things that are entangled in it. And uh, it's really hard to just, you know, dedicate one hour. And we actually didn't get to answer any questions, but... You know, you can, everyone is, you know, very much invited to, to continue the conversation on Instagram or, you know, reaching out to either one of us um, for, for further um, answers. So, again, Sebastian, yeah, thank you so much. send us some questions. Yes, we can, happy to, like, <laughs> fill them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. That was a pleasure. That okay. was so fast, you know, like, we didn't touch upon, I have, I can show you. I have my diagram and I didn't touch it. Oh, the diagram. I have so many issues to touch, you know, like not only anecdotes about gray parrots, which I was so impressed by, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> also other serious things, you know. Someone said that they wanted a pair of parrots for themselves, like that's the parrot I want. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's a new generation, it's the future. Those parrots are the future, you know. <laughs> 
Awesome. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.